Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, this evening uh, on behalf of England and England Hockey and Vitality and obviously Great Britain Hockey. It's great to be alongside some of my fellow teammates, Susanna Townsend, uh, Maddie Hinch and Holly Hearn Webb. So welcome, guys. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, that amazing moment uh, where we all won gold. Gosh, I can't believe it was um, sort of four years ago and so to sort of really kick off um, the the sort of chat this evening I thought it'd be very poignant to sort of ask Holly being the one who took that final um, winning moment uh, penalties penalty shootout when that ball actually crossed the line there whole how do you put that into words as to what it feels and then obviously bringing it now to four years down the line um, gosh, yeah. I still, after four years, I don't think can really um, put it into words about that moment, but it definitely still feels like a, a dream even now. I don't think it will really sink in in terms of what the whole squad achieved until I sort of retired and finished playing, I think. But that moment was, I mean, it's what every child who starts playing hockey, I guess, dreams of. And I always wanted to go to the Olympic Games. I wanted to be, compete for my country and win a gold medal. And, and never in a million years thought any of that would be possible, like one cap, let alone going to Olympics. So um, incredibly special. Um, and yeah, never, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that I'd be taking the final penalty of an Olympic Games. Um, and probably none of my teammates saw that either. either. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, just incredible. It was, it was all very calm and all very, uh, it was a process and it was in our little bubble until the ball went in the back of the net. And I remember that sort of felt like an age and the time was really, really slow. And then once it was, it was in the back of the net and I was sort of making sure it was, um, that's when it all goes just a bit blurry. Um, and it's just the best feeling in the world. I obviously don't have a celebration because I don't score many goals. And and all <laughs> I could do was jump up and down like a little kid. And that's probably exactly how I felt. Um, and just wanting to see my teammates and them all running towards me and huge smiles on their faces and people crying and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, incredible, incredible moments and incredible memories that I'll never forget. Yeah, so that little moment where you're sort of jumping up and down. I mean, I remember it vividly and I couldn't get to you quick enough. Um, you know, Tao, what do you what were your sort of thoughts or feelings? Obviously, Maddie was still behind the line there, um, sort of uh watching, waiting, but kind of on her own and a bit isolated. And Tao, we all know you like a bit of human contact, so I bet you were one of the first to get in there with uh, to give hold of the cuddle. Well, I've got a really important role to play in shootouts. Weirdly, I've never been asked to even practice a shootout um, still, and I'm now 31. So if you watch the whole lineup, my shin pads are off, and I'm, I'm ready to relax because I know that everyone's got it sorted. And we had a European final a couple of years earlier, and there's a, there was a terrible photo of me when we won um, and when we were about to run in from, the, from everyone who obviously scored their goals. And when we were lining up, and this is terrible to admit because it shouldn't have been something I was thinking about in an Olympic final. But all I thought was, OK, right. the camera's also there. Don't do that again. Don't look stupid again. And, <laughs> and for these guys here, I mean, I wasn't nervous at all, to be honest, because I know the amount of prep that they do. Um, it's been ridiculous watching how, how much Maddie does, how much Holly does, and how much everyone did. And obviously the girls got asked, to practice for years and years and years and, and then when it came to it they absolutely nailed it and I was thinking actually earlier today for Holly it must have been really cool to see everyone running towards her and so all of our memories are probably very different because we've all got different views and different angles from it but for Holly to see the like if you look at it like Kate crying and um, me smiling you can barely see my eyes it's everyone's got all these range of emo ranges of emotion and, and like Holly said it's you don't really remember it and and I wish that I could almost go back and relive it so I could so I could remember it a bit more. So basically you were just thinking about the photo opportunity. Is that basically <laughs> yeah, what you just admitted? <laughs> the GPS was still in, I think, and it's it's the quickest, the quickest hundred yards I've run in my life, I think. So I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mads, obviously you were in a position that was totally different to the rest of us, sort of, we were all sort of standing together arm in arm and, and, and you were the one sort of having to stand on the line and, and um, being your roommate uh, through that experience, I know how much hard graft you've done uh, in sort of your planning and prep, 
not what many people know is that there was one of the athletes that didn't act, we didn't have any planning and prep for oh, one of the dutchies yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly and i know you've done all your backgrounds and then i saw her walk forward i gotta say I, I did see the whites of your eyes at that moment i mean what was going through your mind through that through that and obviously then obviously winning um yeah it's so funny how you remember that because it's absolutely true uh it was Laura, uh, Laurie and, and she I was like who, who the hell is that and I remember thinking I'm gonna look in my past notes because I had them all in there and she'll be in here somewhere and I'm like flicking the pages and I'm like stop man you're like giving it away that you don't know so I like close it and just like swore everything to the goal be like ah cool it's gonna be fine um but it was like it was, it was such a surreal experience I remember like a couple of years out thinking could you imagine if like we were in the Olympic final and it went to a shootout. And could you imagine, Mad, if you like hadn't done your homework? It'd be like going into an exam, feeling ridiculously unprepared with all so much guilt and nerves and you would just be shocking. So one thing I was gonna definitely do is be incredibly ready. And that's not just me, that was how the, every single person felt. And it's such a nice place to be because you're nervous, but there's no like fear of consequence, I think. There's, there's not that, oh, what shall I do? It was just like, I couldn't have done any more. So I'm just going to try and get in there and, and be as much of a nuisance as I can. Um, and yeah, the homework definitely paid off because it's true under pressure, the resort to something that you're not comfortable doing takes an awful lot of uh, confidence and the Dutch were nervous. So they all pretty much did what was written down in the book. So thank God we'd been through it a million times in the room, hey Chris, it kind of paid off. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was busy watching Sex in the City and you were actually doing something constructive or whatever it was, uh, that was at the time. But that's just my personality against yours. Um, so you were avidly planning and I'm super proud of you. Of course I am. Um, if we had to, I, I guess this is sort of, you know, we've had some nostalgic moments as a group, uh, especially the last sort of couple of days, you know, Tao sort of sharing some of the chat that came through. There was this kind of ingrained relaxed vibe i don't know that's kind of i guess rereading it i i was quite shocked you know we were more worried about who had the peanut butter and whether we could have that on our <laughs> toast rather than actually like worrying about the fact we were just about to take an olympic final um hole did you were you surprised by rereading that that how chilled everybody was we're just about to step out in olympic final yeah probably a little bit i've probably sort of forgotten um but then when i when i saw tal's messages then it just sort of reminded me and that's just how we were and, and i think it just that was exactly how the whole two weeks were it was we've got a game okay we're preparing for that game we're so prepared for it we play it we recover the next day exactly the same every single recovery day it was exactly the same we went to the british school we did our swimming we did our stretching yeah we went back, we did our homework, then it's a game. So it was just every day was the same. Uh, and so it's the same on the WhatsApp group. That's how it sort of came across. It was just another day, just another game. Um, and it just happened that it was an Olympic final, but that didn't change anything about us. And, and that's why we were successful there is because it was just a process um, yeah. and just a routine that we sort of got into. Yeah, absolutely. And like a winning a winning formula, I guess, you know, I, I was in and amongst it, I kind of know, but, you know, how do you recreate that, Tao? You know, we've we've come from uh, an environment where you've obviously won and a lot of the stuff we've discussed afterwards is, was about winning after winning. And I haven't been part of the group since, obviously, Rio. What was the winning formula and how do we emulate it? I know it's a difficult thing to sort of ask you, but that's it's a it's just it's so difficult to do, I guess, but in, with different group and different people. It's um it's all very well when you have a new group coming in. It happens after every Olympic cycle. There's new people coming in, there's people leaving, coaches change, and and then we made the decision to to keep our same vision, which as we've already mentioned, probably it's it's incredibly it's, it's so powerful. It's inspire the future, be the difference, and create history. And and we sat down as a new group and and we decided to keep it. And every single person in that room at the time had to own it and say okay i believe that we should keep this this is this is the the values changed underneath it but the actual vision stayed the same and and i think fundamentally having that and looking at our history that we obviously as a as a 31 in the rio cycle created it's it's something that we can now take and then take forward it's we've obviously over for the two-year period after we, we did struggle um and i think it's taken the last sort of year for us to really really find our feet and and we all joke around, it's still something that's talked about today in, in a meeting when we had to go through our super strengths and our A to Z game. And um, and as you all know, which everyone knows, I think I was this arrogant youngster growing up who thought she could take on the world and not care about defending and just be really good at attacking. And 
And my lesson from that was not going to London. Anyway, you would have thought I would have learnt my lesson after that and then coming into into the Rio cycle. And you guys remember it. We sat down and said, like, I like to I like to break a line and create an impact. And Helen Richardson Walsh turned around to me and said, Tao, all we want you to do is do the really simple things really well and create wit. And I know it sounds stupid, but it's a phrase that we still talk about today as a squad because you have youngsters coming in who, of course, they want to, to be the best players. They want to take on 10 players running through. But, but something we've created now as a squad, which has taken time, is to make everyone realise that all they need to do is do the simple things really well. And, and I think it has taken us a while to get to that point. Um, but I think finally now everyone's starting to learn that you work hard for each other. You, you do the simple things well. You know the end goal, which is, is ultimately to, to go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. And it will never be the exact same as it was because it, that's impossible to recreate. And, and I think if you have that in your head, then it actually makes it a little bit difficult because for someone like me, that was the feeling I had straight away. It should be the same. Instead, the same it should, my jokes with my teammates should be the same. I should be, everyone should be sort of around me. Um, and then suddenly you're this old girl in a team and you've got all these youngsters that have played together before and, and things change. And, and I think for me individually, that took me personally a while to actually adjust to. But I think now mm. as a balance, and I think Maddie will agree, is that we're a more rounded squad than we've ever been. Um, and we now know our roles a lot better. And and I think having the extra year, which we now have for an Olympics, will, will mean or even better than before, which is really exciting. Yeah, absolutely, Tao. It's it's difficult to emulate, isn't it? What what we originally had, different personalities, different group members, uh, different attributes, you know, all of those things that we'll have to kind of connect, which I think is what was the lovely experience of Rio is that we kind of all connected on on such a level and and we were known really for sort of the teamwork and us all sort of buying into that that common purpose. So you've sort of mentioned um, uh, Tokyo being pushed back, but we obviously haven't mentioned uh, the sort of nightmare that we've all been going through around the world with COVID and this kind of restrictions um, that we've all had. So um, how's lockdown been for you, Mads? I, I know you've got your own little awesome gym that you've had set up for you which is, it seems really tough mate um but how, how have you how have you sort of managed yourself through it well i'm, I'm now a full-time weightlifter so <laughs> if all else fails i'll go into that no, um, uh, no it's, it's been mixed like obviously the games the game for spain was absolutely the right decision and i think the fact that it was told to us relatively quickly helped um because that uncertainty became really difficult to to sit with like are we going are we not and not being able to really do what was required was getting quite frustrating so the fact that the BOA and everyone kind of came to that term quite quickly made us allowed to sit back and go okay it is what it is now but let's see how we manage this period of time that we have and we we're really kind of grateful to the team and I know probably speak on behalf of the others that they or to the to the management sorry that they kind of let us off the lead a little bit during that period and said it's important now that actually hockey is not important and then you look at it like that and you go and be with your friends and family and the people that matter most and you take time here to switch off um and uh so yeah so uh it's been strangely i think for me strangely enjoyable i'm one of the oldies too and um and i've really enjoyed sitting still and not flying around all over the, the all over the place and being able to focus on the, uh, the strength and conditioning side. So that's what has been super nice. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of us have decided to, to use that time in a way that suits them. And for me, having had the break quite recently, I wanted to get back to kind of where I was physically, hence the gym. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there was no way I wasn't going to come back in, in some decent shape. So it's been good. I've, I've kind of enjoyed it, but definitely looking forward to getting back to normality when the time comes. Cool. Um Hole, nice of you to rejoin us. Um, Sorry. Sorry. I'm a little <laughs> late. It, it wouldn't be me if I didn't point it out. Um, no, just just the um, you know, the sort of concept of of lockdown and then of course this sort of the pushback of Tokyo. Now you guys have all been involved in, you know, numerous cycles collectively between you. Um how do you manage that? I mean, you're obviously at the helm now, Hull. How do you how do you sort of manage some of the people through that? And obviously, you think you're you are aiming for something, and it gets moved back 12 months. Uh, I'm sure you've had this this question a number of times now, especially recently. How are we going to managing the team through it, and also on an individual level? Like it's you know when you're one of the older athletes, as Maddie's just said, you know you think possibly that you you've got other plans, other things sort of planning. You know what what how have you kind of gone about it? 
Um, I guess it all happened so quickly. Uh, we were sort of planning for a warm weather trip in South Africa, and then all of a sudden that wasn't on and we were in lockdown. And the, the trickiest bit at the start was, well, I guess tricky, but then at the same time, easy bit was the Olympic Games were still going ahead at that point. And until we got confirmation that they, that they weren't, um, then the whole squad were having to train at home individually um, and just be as creative as possible to train as if we're going to Olympic Games. So everyone was motivated and everyone was doing that at home. And actually, I think that probably bonded us a little bit even tighter to one another, even though we were doing that in various different locations. Um, and then once we obviously got the confirmation that the Olympics had been postponed for a year, that is when then we started to look at, okay, how do we keep connected at the same time as giving everyone some space and some time apart, which is really important for everyone to spend time with their families. Um, and I guess we've tried to stay connected in various different ways. I guess like everyone in the working environment, um, we've done lots of Zoom calls, uh, both from a psychology point of view, as in check-ins in small groups and big groups. Um, we've tried to do some social things as groups with some quizzes and bake-off and various different things using some of the girls' talents in our squad. Um, so we had Grace leading a, a yoga class, which was good. Um, and, and then just leading a bake off. So that was that was great. So we've had to be a bit creative. Um, but I think even looking back to the Rio cycle, I think we obviously we won gold and that was incredible. But the thing that made that so incredible was the journey we've been on for the four years before. And it wasn't it wasn't a smooth ride. It was definitely a roller coaster. And two years before we were at sort of the lowest of lows in terms of how we felt as a team and both individually. Um, and that's what then made Rio is so special and so I think this group and this challenge and how we've sort of come through this challenge and tried to stay connected is just stands us in really good stead and we felt that since being back on the pitch um, since obviously COVID and it's obviously not the same or socially distanced but it, it feels even tighter now because we've been through that together um, and at the same time everyone's so excited to be back on the pitch and, and so excited about the next 12 months and the opportunity that, that another 12 months gives this group being a relatively young squad young squad yeah because it can feel a bit of a grind can't it because you're just sort of four years of just constant three weeks on one week off or whatever it is and that's just the truth isn't it that kind of not everybody always says um, Tao, you've obviously got a rippling six pack in your guns to, to make sure you maintain. Um, how did you manage to do that through through the COVID lockdown period? Um, I've, I've, to be honest, I've, I've really needed this period of time um, and I didn't realise that I did need it. Um, after Rio, I had my, my knee surgery that I needed and I never had time away from fish or time away from the programme. And ironically I really started to enjoy my hockey again from sort of November December um so I felt like it was a really exciting six months and I've spoken quite openly about it that I, I have struggled to enjoy my hockey over the last sort of four years and actually for the last six seven eight months I've loved it again and I've refound my form and but it made me realize that my body just needed to do something a little bit different um I needed to for me to be able to play the way that I want to play I need to I needed to sort my ankle out. I needed to be in better shape. I needed to be happier within myself as well. And and actually having, like Maddie sort of alluded to earlier, that we, very different to other sports actually, our management made a, a brave decision sort of from the outside world, but actually it wasn't. It was, we're trusting you all as athletes. You know what to do. You know what to gym. You know the running you have to do. Make a decision yourself. And, and I think for me personally, being given that trust and having that choice was incredibly valuable to me because if you'd have told me to go on a Zoom session every day to do a circuit, I would have hated it because I would have still been on a schedule. And, and actually this way it was, I wake up and I want to go and train. And, and for me, the feeling of having that choice and actually wanting to go and do it was something that, that I definitely needed because it gave me that, that sort of training mojo that I'd certainly lost. And and actually, very similar to Maddie, I feel like I've come back in the best shape of my life, actually. And and that's something that I didn't potentially think, or I didn't, well, I definitely didn't think I could get back to that point. And, and it's made me really excited to, for the next year or so um, to crack on with the girls. But it's, um, I needed it, and I didn't realise they did. And I think everyone has responded in very different ways. But, but actually, as a whole, everyone sort of, when you come back to training, I remember the first day when we came back after COVID, and 
and I was thinking it was going to be this grand event and actually it was just oh you're right everyone no, let's go again <laughs> and that was sort of it and, and it sort of sums us up as a group because that's your life for so long and you know what yeah. you're doing you're there to play hockey and, and that's sort of what everyone did and, and that was quite nice actually for general for the general public just to sort of open it up to the floor you know um and obviously with my my position as vitality champion just to bring them in there's been a big issue around mental health and having a purpose i guess through lockdown because your routines all changed and and we come from an environment being elite athletes that are just routine driven you know what what kind of ways have you guys sort of d used should i say that have actually proved fruitful around sort of trying to regain a purpose you know you've said you've been given some freedom which is amazing uh, and the fact that they've empowered you to be able to do that um how have you guys sort of coped with that freedom that is kind of unique because you're not used to it in our environment you know, we, you know we're used to being having a routine and being told what to do all the time and that's a lot like joe public as well <laughs> I certainly went the opposite of Towner, um, but that's not because that's no that, that's nothing wrong with you. It's just my personality. My personality type. My personality type is different. Um, and I'm very much like like you said, we're we're used to a routine. We're used to having a schedule, and therefore the thought of me not having one of those was just really scary. Um, and so from the very beginning, I. You know, I populated my Google Calendar as if it was a normal week and sort of put my two sessions in and put them in on certain times and all stuff like that. Just make sure that I got up and then I did my session. And then it actually then made me, it enabled me to concentrate and do other things in between because I knew I'd done them and it was in there and and therefore I didn't have the, the guilt that Maddie was talking about or the feeling, oh, I should be doing this or I'm not going to be prepared if I go back, etc. I actually absolutely love it. Let's carry on then. That's how a team works. You have lots of different individuals. That's <laughs> why you're not. Yeah, it's not even the least. <laughs> it would be rubbish if everyone was like me. So so I am social sex. Join. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. You, you do have some responsibility. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but from a position of sort of that, managing that's and helping people, is that is that that's how you tick, though, isn't it? Whole, yeah, like exactly. you like and structure, think, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there'll be people like that. To, key to everyone is to just know yourself and like know what works for you, and that is different for everyone. So for me, having that structure, having that routine is is really good for me. And yet for Tao, it's the opposite. Just having that bit more freedom and and choice over when she does things, and that's what's really worked for Tao. And yeah and that's what works for me so it's sort of exploring and trying to figure out individually what is the best thing for you i guess i think it's been quite nice to see because we've had loads of keeping connected um weekly meetings and actually everyone was really open about how they were coping um right. which i think it's, it's very hard to show your vulnerability with stuff um and there were times when i, I i've said it's been incredible but there were obviously times when i was also struggling and and actually, I think the strength of the group was that everyone was incredibly honest about how they were coping and the little coping mechanisms that they had. And the fact that we've been able to get to that point during lockdown is sensational, really. Because, and, and maybe it's because you're behind the camera. I don't know. Maybe it's because you're not in a room and it's not as scary and your internet can cut off. But, but actually, everyone, everyone showing their vulnerability and being, being really incredibly open. Like as you know, Krista, in the, the Rio cycle, that's the point we got to, and that's where we are now, which which I think is incredible. But also as a team, I guess, like we're used to being surrounded by people all the time, and suddenly you find yourself training on your own and having to find the motivation to do stuff on your own. And there are moments, I mean, everyone just assumes athletes are like invincible and they never have those moments where they think, do you know what, I just want to stay in bed. I don't want to get up and I don't want to do that. And, and lockdown, absolutely, all of us have felt like that. And, and I, I, you know, there's, there's sort of people out there that are sort of really, really keen to sort of understand people that are used to structure and used to a team environment. What were sort of the key things? I mean, I did some really quirky things, like just just to give me a purpose, like tried a new project and tried to do something different. Mads, did you, did, have you got any sort of words of wisdom for people who are kind of feeling that little bit isolated and, and, and need that little bit of direction and, and, and assistance that you use to cope? Yeah, I mean, I, I was in an unusual situation because I had housemates. So 
I think I sit between these two in terms of what my approach is. So I too like a structure, but if you don't give me one, I also like to not have that. And I think at the beginning, um, I was all for the whole, I'll do it in my own time and it's okay. And then I realized that it was getting more difficult to actually achieve what I know I should be achieving. So in the end, I started to basically go a bit more down Holly's route and I would attack my mornings. So I really, someone who is not a morning person, those that know me, I've become one. So I'm like, I'm now what? like up, yeah, and I'm up and I'm like excited to tick all my boxes by like 10. And then it's like, I've got the whole day with no like, I need to do this feeling. So we've had to sit where Tyler's like, why are you in the gym already? And I'm like, well, you go and get in the gym. And then she's like, okay, it's like, you made me go. I'm guilty. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Good. <laughs> and honestly, that's been massive. And I think one of the things I also learned was the, the power of this and, and how bad this is. So essentially, I'm one of the worst on my phone. It's like your whole life runs through this, like everything. Um, and the first thing you do normally is look at it. And then you, if you've got some stuff where you're like, oh, I've got to do that, or God, why did they text me? You, it changes your whole mindset. So the one thing I did was stop looking at this until I'd finished in the gym. So I, I had a second phone, turn this one off, and then look at my other one, which only had like three people on it. So massive like change for me that I now will use 100% going forward but I needed that time to work out that that difference and um so I'm very kind of self-driven but having housemates as well and watching them train made you also want to kind of get stuck in so we did some stuff together and, and that I was very fortunate with so I was never really on my own but from a hockey spill hockey skill perspective um like how do you train that stuff like without opposition you know all of that kind of thing like you can keep fit you can nail it in the gym uh you know you can do all of that stuff on your own but there are things that need your team and we've got a lot of hockey players of course that are all like looking for sort of ways that they can still with the social distancing in place like practice some of the skills and there's there's only so many cones you can put out and go around them before it you know like what, what how have you guys sort of managed to to be able to keep hockey hockey ready because the seasons are all starting you know the people that are wanting to get cracking um, I guess, first of all, it's just to not put pressure on yourself that if you're not doing that much hockey or not able to do that much hockey, it's fine. Um, some of the girls have been really creative. So Tess Howard and our squad has been really creative. Like how she's been getting her hockey in. And um, and then other girls probably haven't picked up their stick as much or just using their garage or their carpets. Um, so it's been, it's been a real mixture. But I think the first one for most of us was to don't put pressure on ourselves and actually the girl's been back a few weeks now and it's been very individual skill focused and um just watching the group they're now probably as sharp as i've seen them on the pitch and it hasn't taken that long to get back to that and they've really enjoyed sort of the individual skill stuff that um they've been doing over the past few weeks so that's been great but apart from that our coaches have been great in sending us uh videos and clips to watch so just keep our like hockey brains and decision making sort of ticking over um so that that's also been good that's the bit you lose isn't it it's the kind of as you say the decision making the sort of impulsive reactive sort of stuff um tau as that dynamite midfielder how have you been uh keep it keeping it up mate um to be honest because i think because i have had stints in rehab it probably made my experience a little bit easier. Um, so right at the start of lockdown, I made the decision to treat it like a rehab, like a rehab phase to get my body in mm. the best shape possible. Um, which for me, and it's, everyone's different, but for me, that was quite healthy because I tried to play some hockey on the carpet and maybe I'm just terrible, but I was terrible. Um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, best not do this for a while. Um, so I didn't. So I focused on all the other, other areas that I simply can't focus on enough when I'm playing hockey because... There's only so many, hours, so many hours in a day and there's stuff, for example, my mobility. So I made a, a decision to, to have some online mobility coaching to pay for it myself. And that's not a dig at anyone or anything. It's I paid for it myself because for me, I had to feel more accountable. Um, and you're accountable anyway from your coaches, from your physios, from your S&C. But for me, the process, it sounds silly, of handing over money made me feel accountable. And, and actually having that that someone checking up on me, someone saying, and this is why I say I liked all the freedom, but it got to the point where I needed to be told what to do as well. And and actually um, 
the thing that's always sort of held me back, and I've been stubborn to admit this to myself, is my mobility and touching my toes. And the reason that I've had so many injuries is because I was this 16 year old that wouldn't run down. And so for everyone listening, if you're a youngster, even if you're old, you can make you can make changes even at the age of 31. I can feel myself getting a little bit Sure. <laughs> I, can, I, I mean I can't touch my toes but I feel that side of my game I'm getting back because of all this extra stuff and and like Holly said going back to hockey it's like when you go on a long haul trip and we've all experienced it when you land off your jet lag that's how you feel you feel like you can't connect with anyone you feel like you don't know how to hit a ball but give yourselves a week you remember how to play hockey it's a bit like riding a bike you don't forget how to play and that's the thing that I realised quite quickly is, yes, I may be rubbish for the first week or so, but even if I'm rubbish, I'm really excited to still be here. I'm having a good time with my mates. And I think the biggest thing I did, and I've been really open about my training on social media, actually, because I wanted to share everyone some time. It's just a really bad day and you don't want to train. Some days, some days I'm not pd or I have, I've missed that day, so I'm doing it this day. And... And I, at the very beginning, did stuff that I enjoyed. So what made me feel better? And that wasn't necessarily to make myself a better hockey player, but it was like, what's going to make me feel good at this time? And then as I got closer to actually being back as a, as a hockey player, I had to change it up a little bit and do more change of direction that I knew would maybe compromise my body a bit more. But it was the stuff that I needed to do to be back being a hockey player. And so that's what I did. So anyone who is about to get back to hockey, start doing the change of direction stuff. Keep strengthening your legs a little bit because that's the thing that I found probably I've lost is the strength in my legs. And and when you do that, you'll be absolutely fine. You're all hockey players and you know how to play. Um, <laughs> and you'll definitely sleep better when you start playing because your brain has to work, which is something that I certainly haven't done for at least six months. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. But Mads, you're obviously in a pretty unique position being a being a goalie and at times obviously a little bit more used to doing stuff on your own, albeit there's sort of the goalie goalie club, as it were. But you, you kind of are in isolation in some in some ways. Um, you know, how have you have you kind of uh, managed to keep your training up to speed? Because I know there's a lot of budding young goalkeepers and slightly older goalkeepers that are super keen to sort of hear the tips from you, Mads, about how you've how you kind of take on your training now and, and, and how you've managed yourself through the process. Yeah, I mean, I think at the start, I was some of the other girls and I gave myself the break from the pads um, and then, but I knew at some stage I needed to get back into it. Otherwise that ball would be traveling at me and I'd have no idea what to do it being before I've even processed it. So again, replicating like a hundred kilometer shots is not, not really possible in my garden. Um, even though the boys have said they'll do it, but we're not having that. I want my windows all intact. Um, and so I've just kind of been getting the pads on and rolling around in the garden, which sounds really weird. And my neighbors think I'm a right with it. Absolutely. Um, but it's been quite cool actually, because I was a bit like at the beginning, how am I possibly going to like replicate anything in this like small space? Um, and that's the cool part about social actually, was that loads of people were starting to do similar things and then ideas were coming in. So I kind of jumped on board and was like, right, let's see what we can do and let's share that. So just getting in my kit and scrambling around and working on those movements without a ball makes a huge difference. And like, and, and that's almost a bit like what Tana does, getting herself into these deep positions. If I don't do that for ages, I'm gonna be injured within a matter of weeks going back on the pitch. So having had those kind of goalkeeper specific movements dipped in and around those weeks, um, definitely made a difference when I got back. So I actually got in and had no goalkeeping doms, which was a miracle. And it must have been down. It must have been down to all my teddy bear rolls, as I call them in the garden. Um, you remember what you said to me though, first day we came back, Maddie, before we started what? playing. What? We walked into the pitch and you were like, Towner, this is the best we're gonna feel for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I was like, all right, buddy, all right. <laughs> I was yeah, shaping my life. Yeah, you were fine. I could walk. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, there you go. So that's what I've been doing. So I guess just kind of looking after your bodies, really, through the pro doing what you can do, uh, just managing what, what you're able to manage, I guess, is kind of the, the, the take home, isn't it? And then just believe that when you do eventually get the opportunity to get back on the pitch, um, you know, you, you it will come back. You will still um, be that hockey player that you always were. Um, just to quickly open up a little bit to some of the questions, because I know a lot of people did actually write in um, and ask some questions. So first up, Hull, um, 
uh, from Sarah Wardley. Uh, she asked, we often heard you talk about the processes um, that Danny had you focus on. Can you give some examples of what those processes were and were they generic basically to the whole team or just sort of individual processes? So we, we definitely had processes um, both individually and and as a squad. So our individual processes, we did a lot of work with uh, Andrea, our psychologist, in terms of those, in terms of how we turn up on a training day, how we turn up on a match day, uh, what we're thinking. And we did so much about the penalty shuffles from a mental point of view. Um, but yeah, equally, we had so many as a squad. And, and that, when we went to the Olympics, we were the most prepared team there in terms of we spoke about all different processes from what what if scenarios um to yeah uh, how, how our daily prep was going to look that morning or what individually we needed to do um before a match exercise wise so we all had different um exercises that we would do to make us feel in the best position um so different examples process for us um yeah would be would be our exercises before a match uh we also had our own individual process we'll do with the the laptop and swatting so like mads does with the girls that are doing shootouts and corners we would do uh, if we were in the pcd team we'd do our corner prep having a look at their pca who was coming into your area um so everything was on a daily basis exactly the same on our rest day we'd do all the prep and then on a match day that's all done and you don't have to think about it um and it was just our routine as i mentioned before so get up we do our daily prep, we go to breakfast, then we come back, we'll have a meeting, some rest, and and everything was so sort of blocked in. Um, and yeah, individuals had different recovery methods. So some of the girls use leg pumps, some of them use compacts, some of them just ice bath. Um, so all of those are individualized, but recovery itself as a process was the same for everyone was going to do that for our whole squad. Um, yeah, I, I guess that probably answers the question. <laughs> Sorry, I just dropped out there, but I'm assuming you've uh, you've finished. But yeah, in, in, in essence, um, basically we yeah we all sort of had our individual things. But things like priming, I guess, like that was very new for for me in Rio. You know, whereas you sort of think, what? So I'm going to go and get myself ready, heighten my heart rate massively, and then let it come back down again to do the warm up, and then and then actually play. It, it doesn't make logical sense to me, but it definitely made me feel prepared. And those are kind of things that I think were quite unique to our group. Would you agree, Hol? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, even so, for some people, the physical element really helps how they physically feel on the pitch. And and as a whole, it doesn't matter whether that is actually true or if it's just the mental impact that you think you're more prepared. So for some people, they felt physically better and other people, it was just the, the mental I'm prepared that we had on it. But yeah, that was definitely something we'd looked at over the four years and it started out very generic across the whole squad. And then the closer we got to the games, it then became really individualized. Mm -hmm. So some girls knew that sprints on the bike is what best prepared them or made them feel good and for other girls it was jumps with on boxes I know for me I had like a little mini circuit so it was loads of different things that mm. helped me um and again that just sort of we're a whole squad that everyone's very different um so everyone primed but everyone had their individual plans Um, yeah, absolutely. Tao, um, Dexter uh, Hiscock has said, um, how do you push yourself further when you've won the biggest sporting accomplishment? And I think that's, you know, we discussed the winning after winning mentality, but when you've already achieved it and then suddenly you've got another four years, which has now been extended to five, what do you do? <laughs> how do you do it? It's, um... I think any elite athlete or anyone that's successful, it's, and this isn't putting a down on it, on it, but for me, it's a feeling of, will anything ever be enough, if that makes sense? And I think that's the way I feel. It's you, <clears throat> it's the best moment of your life winning an Olympic gold medal. It undoubtedly is, but the feeling for me is I, I want more and there is more. And and, and I think for all of us individually and people that are still playing, we all want to be better athletes. We all want to, to not just win one gold medal. We want to continue the legacy like the girls have, well, that Great Britain and England hockey have done for years. And, and especially from, from London, the whole thing was the legacy. And we are the legacy that we want to continue. And 
And one of our things is is making our sport better for generations and generations to come in our country. And and us, the best way to do that is ultimately by us being successful. And and I think it's very you look at, for example, a lot of youngsters that when they're growing up who don't get selected or and all of us actually, I think all of us with Maddie, for example, went to junior went to junior world cup, didn't play. It's we've all had setbacks and to be successful, to be an elite athlete and reach the top, you always want more. And and that's the way that I feel. It's yes, if uh, for me personally, going to Tokyo and getting selected and being on that plane will be almost my biggest achievement after the how I felt the last four years would be has been. But then mm. us now in this position, I feel like we're we're very capable of of winning another gold medal and and Olympics, it's a it's an equal playing field. Everyone's there to win. It's where everyone wants to go, and it's the it's the pinnacle of our sport. And it's the dream, like Holly spoke about earlier, that you when you start playing hockey or any sport, it's mm. it's where you want to be. And and actually, I think for me and for for us, the girls that are continuing playing, because it is hard. It is you get home from that plane when you get off the plane, and you do your media stuff, and then you go and sit on your couch, and you're like. All well, my mates are gone. What am I doing? I'm by myself. Um, and I've got to do all of that again. I've got to, for me, when lockdown happened, I was like, another November in the cold. Like, sod that. That's awful. <laughs> it's raining in the cold. But actually, you're still here. And Holly spoke about the journey, and that's part of the journey. And yeah. it's the pain, it's the hurt, it's the elation of winning. You do it for all of those things. And But for me, nothing will ever be enough. And I'm okay with that. And I know, for example, if we'd be able to look in the mirror in a year's time and know that, that individually and as a squad, we've done everything we possibly can, even if we don't bring home the gold medal, then I know that, and I think we will, but everyone would be as proud as they can be, and, and that's enough. I guess along the same lines, Mads, uh, David Edmondson asked, um, after such a magnific magnificent and life-changing achievement, how do you reset and cope with the aftermath? Maybe the realisation that you hit a peak you may not reach again. <laughs> no, oh, this guy. It's a really good question, and it's one that for a, a little while I wasn't really happy to talk about. But to be honest, mm -hmm. I think the for me that period after Rio, till I took a break, was like ridiculously tough. I struggled with it on so many levels, um, both individually and from like a team perspective in the fact that when you have a taste of like that ultimate feeling, you want it all the time. Like you almost become greedy and it's like, why are we not in a final? Why are we not in a final? <laughs> and like, I just couldn't process that it was a new group and things take time. And it was just me completely seeing it wrong and just wanting to be in those moments over and over again. And for, then from an individual's perspective, yeah, things came together, perfect timing here over in Rio. Do I think that was my peak? No, I don't. I think I was quite a young keeper and I think um, keepers get better with age, like wine, red wine particularly. <laughs> Stick uh, with that. <laughs> I'm still, yeah, I'm still striving for that. But for that first two years, I 100% tried to repeat that performance, particularly the final, in every game I played. And I put a ridiculous amount of pressure on myself to be almost superhuman, which was what the papers were saying. Having had absolute shockers in the lead up to Rio where I've let in some terrible goals like no one remembers that but the papers just show these like highlights and like <laughs> I'm some superhuman and I was seeing it all the time and hearing it all the time and everyone had more opinions of me and I was like oh my god and got it completely wrong and burnt myself out totally um and, and a bit like town I stopped enjoying it and hence I stepped away um so I'm so glad I did because my perspective on it all has changed do I want to win? Absolutely, it's in my nature, 100%, um, but I have to understand where we are at and my role now. It's changed dramatically. I've not got you in front of me and Kate and that, and I can just chill at the back and just tell you who's left and right. <laughs> like, now it's like, we got a young group and, and they turn to you and, and they expect you under those real like key moments to step up and when like mm. shit, it's the fire and you're there. Like those guys are there and you, you can't, you, you just have to be different. And it's taken some time for me to kind of get, get used to that role. And I'm now enjoying that like leadership element. And at the beginning I was shying away from it and I just wanted essentially to constantly be at my best. And it's just incredibly unrealistic for any athlete. 
Um, so it's taken some time, but it's been quite a journey. And I think this will make me stronger in the end. Um, and I've definitely got a few more years in me. So I can't remember his name, but thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> David oh, Edmondson. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think that's unique um, to you, Mads, either. I think, you know, any any athlete through any part, they we're, we have ups and downs. And God, if there's ever anybody who's taken and stepped away from the field, that's me. You know, I did three years, no hockey, and then came back. You know, it's, it is very doable. You know, sometimes you just need a bit of a break. And that's, and we are really harsh on ourselves and we put loads of pressure on ourselves, especially pressure of expectation when it's mounted on top of us. And, and we're in exactly that position. I say we, but the Great Britain girls and boys who are training for, 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 for Tokyo, you know, are very much in that position where there's, there is an expectation on our shoulders because we have had success before. And so how do you then utilize that to the, to the best of, um, of your ability? So whole, um, a question from Gina Bassett, who asks, what one characteristic or personality trait do you think is most important to succeed in hockey? <laughs> I think this one's pretty easy. Um, I would say that that is resilience. Um, so looking across the board in terms of the girls in the squad, the girls I've played with in, in the Rio cycle, I think that's something that all of those girls had. Um, and then from an individual perspective, I definitely wasn't the most talented junior hockey player in under 16s, under 18s, 21s, etc. Um, and there were definitely more technical, way more gifted players. Um, but then you look back and you're like, well, where are they? And they're doing other things. And obviously people make different choices. But ultimately, I think those that make it, like Towner said, have, have had their ups and downs, not been selected things, not been picked up, but they've picked themselves up. They've worked out what their strengths are and focus on their strengths and not look at their weaknesses or things they can't do. Like, I'm never going to be someone that just loads of 3D skills and scores incredible goals. That's just not me. So then you, you figure out, okay, what are my strengths? Okay, so they're, they're, from my example, they're like my core skills, which is really dull and boring, but they're my strengths and that's what I'm going to make my super strengths and that's what I'm going to use to get me selected and to get me as high up into the international um, sort of senior squad as possible. And, and that's what I've done. And I think... Again, you look across the board, the the women I played with that are the most inspiring are those that have done that. And again, you only have to look in the Rio squad and not just the the 16 that were there on the pitch, but the three girls that we had in the stands and the girls that didn't make it and were back home. Any one of them could have gone and we still would have had the same result because every single one of them was resilient. And that is, I think, I think that's a little bit that we're we're born with and then we develop that as well. Um, but that's essentially why they made the senior squad and that's what made us successful because the training is pretty brutal at times. Um, the challenges we have are pretty brutal, both again on an individual and a team perspective. And, and the decisions that we make in life, they're not sacrifices because we make those decisions, but we do. Everything is about hockey. Our whole lives is about hockey and we have to plan everything. And it's, it's our decision and it's a privilege to do that. Um, but we, you know, when I'm not doing my normal things that that my friends from university are doing and that's fine I'm in my opinion I'm doing way more exciting things um but that just builds that resilience and again with this the COVID and us training apart I feel that our squad currently is is has experienced a bit of that and we're gaining that and you can feel it with how we are on the pitch and that's hopefully again something we're going to develop over the next 12 months that will really help help us Probably. I know you said that you um your goal scoring isn't a strength of yours. Didn't you, didn't you get top goal scorer under sixteen at the tournament? Under eighteen, actually. Under yeah. eighteen, you did. Yeah. And scored the winning goal sense. for us yeah. to win gold, which is uh, you take that all day long, mate. If that's the only goal you ever score, yeah. that is the one you want. We actually, Chris, we actually had a quiz months ago, and there were like options reeled off, but who was the top goal scorer at under eighteen something? And no one said Holly. No. <laughs> it's not even Holly. <laughs> no, I didn't. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. Hull, um, absolutely. Then uh, moving on to Tao, uh, your next up, mate. Uh, Karina Bailey Watson says you love a bit of emotion, so I thought this one would be very apt for you. Um, <laughs> what is the best thing? What is the best thing? we can do as hockey fans and spectators to help encourage the team when watching live matches mate and i know you love an audience so you just tell them <laughs> exactly. 
just one petrified about COVID <laughs> and everything else is going on with it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, to be honest, if anyone who's sort of watching, listening, went to the World Cup, the the noise that we had when we came out, it was electric, and and it was a tough tournament for us. Like it, but for us to to have that noise, to have that encouragement, it's for hockey and this is being a little bit brutal but I've always found that hockey fans aren't loud enough and you want the singing you want the passion you you want it all and it's it's typically and again for me saying this typically British I find and it's you want as much noise as you possibly can because it, 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 it there's no coincidence people say 12 man 12 woman it's it gets you going you feel like you've got people on your side and when you're struggling a little bit yes inside yourself you have that that motivation to run that a little bit faster, to do that diving tackle, to to score that goal, and but at the same time, if you hear people willing you on, apart from Maddie all the way back there, then it's going to help you. And for me, you need it. We're very used to playing without a crowd, and we we certainly have that motivation in ourselves. But to hear you guys on the sidelines, to to actually even hear when we come and sign the autographs, your stories, who you are, where you come from, what position you play, talk to us ask questions of us because we love that side of what we do as well and and you do help us don't underestimate the power that you give us because it, it is something that personally for me really does help so give as much as you can unless I'm rubbish and then just don't do <laughs> and maybe hold a town a sign or something yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. go town go town <laughs> that'll be scary, so it's fine <laughs> can always count on Leslie yeah. um Mads, yeah. just a bit of a, a goalkeeper specific um, one. Um, it's quite generic, but um, a few do's and don'ts. So apart from getting the ball away from the goal, which is obviously the ideal, this is from Lucy Clough, is uh, what are the do's and don'ts of defending from the perspective of a goalkeeper, other than just keeping it out of the goal? <laughs> well, do's and don'ts. Um, I'm listening, I'm listening here, <laughs> <laughs> Not, Wait, are we talking from a do's and don'ts as a goal? or doing dates yeah. as a view of a goalkeeper for the defence. Goalkeeper. Just one do, one don't probably, we'll, we'll, we'll cover it. I think the do is to be decisive in your decisions. Hesitation is the worst thing you can do. You're better off committing to something um, and, and kind of reflecting on the outcome than spending your life in that kind of midway zone. Um, and I think you, the more you practice that in training, the better you do. So for me, my strength was my weakness for so many years. Like I've always been quick and agile, but I wanted to fly out all the time. And then I met Karen Brown and she was like, that's like <laughs> I, hope I remember good. those days back at Leicester, mate. I remember them so well. Maddie's coming and everybody out of the way. Boy, because you're going to get taken too. <laughs> um, so like, like stick with it though. Again, like as Holly mentioned earlier, it's those, those strengths. It was always a strength, and I think I, for a number of years, people didn't like that, and it really struggled to get me picked. But then when I came under a coaching group that went, hey, that's a strength of yours. We've just got to manage it, and it will become your super strength. So that would be my do, and a don't. Oh, that would be my don't. And oh, what, what did I do? <laughs> that would be your do, love. That would be your do. You, you, you need the don't. So I now need to do the don't. <laughs> be decisive. Come on, make a decision. Be decisive. Yeah, exactly. That's your do. And then you don't, it's to fly out. Don't fly out. Oh, you yeah. said it. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Was I confusing you? Sorry, mate. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you've covered it. I think, I think we're good. Um, Hold, just quickly um, about sort of, you know, vitality is all about keeping people healthy, keeping people active. Um, and we've all said it um, a lot this evening, all about inspiring the next generation and doing things. Sort of what, if you had to give sort of one nugget or one message about inspiring people that, probably aren't naturally active, um, what would it be uh, so that we can try and get the nation sort of a little bit more uh, into sort of a bit of fitness and getting outdoors and, and connecting with nature? Oh, I would say whether you feel anxious about it or you don't think you'll enjoy it, just give it a go. Cause I think you'd be so surprised how much you enjoy things and how much better you will feel. Like exercise is known for making you feel better. But I think the thought of it for quite a lot of people puts mm. them off. Um, but it can be anything, as you said. It can be just getting outside and going on a walk. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, going on a massive run and putting yourself in pain. It can be anything. But also try different things. Like one of the best parts of sports is socialising with different people. So even if you haven't played 
football before or tennis before just sign up and just give it a go because most of the friends that certainly us three I know I've made is through hockey and through sport um so just just get out there and just try things whatever it is because I think everyone will be really surprised about how much they enjoy enjoy those different things and Tao, your mum's been taking on a bit of a challenge. Come on, mate. She's got a, she's got a feature. Like she's done really well. I think that's quite a cool story to just sort of share really quickly. Yeah, she um. So obviously, I think even seeing like me, my family said to me the other week, they were like, "We didn't realise how much you actually have to do and train." And I was like, "Thank goodness, you finally realised." <laughs> I don't know. I just think I just sort of rock up and hit a few hockey balls every day. And my brother actually said to me, "He's like." Sue, I've got a new sort of respect for you because I had no idea this is how much goes into it. Um, my mum was obviously during lockdown, she was with me and she was seeing me go out and then we go out for walks and things. And, and it's hard to say to your family, mum, you need to go for a walk. You need to go and do, and do this and get active. And actually she saw Helen Richardson Walsh doing her Catch the 5K. And, and Catch the 5K is incredible. It's Helen Richardson Walsh, an elite athlete, an Olympic gold medalist, recently had a child and admitting to herself, I need to start doing something different, catch 5k, I haven't exercised properly in a year or so or whatever. And and actually for my mum to see someone of Helen's sort of caliber do that made her think, okay, I can do something. And um, for my mum, she said it's, it's, she's listening now actually, but she, the reason sort of I've told her almost to put her on, on social media and I'm holding her very accountable is because people are drawing inspiration from it. People who are seeing maybe they couldn't run are running. And I'm in, I'm incredibly proud of her because she's putting herself in a position which isn't nice. It's the, like, the feeling of hurting a little bit when you're doing, when you're running and feeling out of breath. It's an uncomfortable feeling. And if you're not an athlete, you're sort of not used to experiencing it. And my mum to put herself in that position and to be that person running around a park by herself a water bottle by herself training gear I've actually never been so proud of her and, and she said to me yeah it's hard but I, she feels better in herself she feels more more comfortable she feels um she's got more confidence and it's not just for me it's not about losing weight as exercise it's how does it make you feel better it's how do I make my heart healthier it's and so I think for my mom and other people and her friends who've been talking about it it's it's making themselves feel better within themselves which is something that it certainly makes me feel like Maddie we'll get uh, the example is that same when I spoke to Maddie when she said about that training session I said to her Mad I really can't be asked to train today like um, it's I'm not in the mood and Maddie was like go do it and send me a photo watch once you've done it so I went do you not I believe said, her Mad <laughs> Have have a, what you don't know is I've got a massive collection of photos. Um, <laughs> of course you have, man. Of course yeah. you have. <laughs> um, but Maddie was quite blunt with me. She's like, kind of go do it. And I was like, yeah, okay. And she was like, you'll feel better for it. And it's the exact same thing, whether you're an elite athlete or whether you're someone that wants to go for a walk. And and that's the pressure that it's almost taken off my mum. It's do this because it's going to make you feel better. Don't just do it because you want to lose weight. Do it because you want to feel healthier and feel better. And like she's now really accountable because everyone's watching. So keep encouraging her because I know that if I cast and we get a message on social media saying, oh, you played well today, Tao. I mean, haven't had it in a couple of years, but you play well today, Tao. <laughs> um, Working it on makes, it. It makes you feel better about yourself. It, it's, it's the exact same thing with everyone. Check in, check in to see how they're doing. Ask how they're feeling because it does make a difference. So for everyone that is struggling with that stuff, just like Holly said, give it a go. And you can change things up. If it doesn't work, find something else. It's absolutely fine. And it's also the fear, I think, of what everybody else is thinking of you as well. A lot of the time, like when you go and join a new class or do something, you're, you're almost so worried. But actually, a lot of the time, they're just thinking about themselves and getting on with their exercise piece. They're not actually that concerned about what you look like or, or what you're doing most of the time. You know, it's just about, as, you, as Hull said, get out there give it a go and if you don't like a certain thing then try something else like it doesn't end there I think a lot of people sort of try a certain activity and then go okay cycling's not for me and then sort of put the whole exercise or active side to, to bed and you talk about inspiring and, and those are kind of the the stories that you want to hear isn't it the, the the person who isn't naturally sort of an athlete or isn't naturally into it that as has given it a go and then and then make some strides whether that's you know massive strides or little ones it doesn't matter as long as you try 
a bit of advice for everyone, make it a part of your routine. So like Holly was saying in the beginning of lockdown, she needed that routine. Make it part of your day that you structure into your day. If you're waiting until you finish work or seven, eight o'clock at night, like you don't want to do it. No one does. It's impossible. So set aside time to do it and hold yourself accountable to it because if you don't, then it'll be, especially when it gets to winter and it starts getting cold, it'll get a little bit tricky. So yeah, set, aside, set some time aside to do it yourselves. Cool guys. Um, I know, I know it's our fourth year anniversary of winning our gold, and I know there's a few of you that want to go and celebrate. I wish I could uh, come and join no, you guys, no, no. and I know Hull, Hull would want to too. That you two, uh, Susan, Mads, make sure you have a couple of drinks for us. Not too many, of course, because you're training. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll all have a massive, massive catch up soon. Uh, we're both Holly and I, are, of course, there in spirit uh, with the team tonight. Um, but yeah, it's been awesome, awesome. Thank you so much on behalf of Vitality for um, speaking to us. And I just like to say, as somebody who sort of sits on the sidelines and puts a microphone in front of your faces regularly, um, good luck with the preparations um, for Tokyo. I know it's not what we all wanted with the postponement, but I know you guys will be absolutely fab. So thank you again on, on behalf of Vitality and everyone take care and please stay safe. Thanks thank so much. you guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.